And just as we begin as well, I want to say welcome to any folks who are connecting with us through our Facebook Live uh, event. Uh, we always, almost always, Facebook Live starting at the sermon time. Some of you sometimes ask us what, what we do, or maybe you've tried to watch and didn't know when to kind of tune in. We, we do that for a couple reasons. Uh, so if you want to talk to me about those, but uh, it's just easiest for us to do it uh, with the sermon. And so if you're tuning in, you're out of town, check us out at about 10 after 11. That's about the time that we go live on Facebook. I also just want to remind you that we post these videos after the fact to our YouTube channel. And so you can always go back and watch it yourself and perhaps uh, learn something more than what you were able to grasp on a Sunday morning. But I would encourage you to share videos with folks as well. We don't just post them there for us. We post them as a way that you can share God's Word with folks that you know. Well, if you are a guest with us today, or if this is a, you've been away because of vacations and things like that for the last couple of weeks, you may not be aware that we are now in week three of a series called At the Movies. And in the first week, we looked at a movie called Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, and uh, we looked at how that movie speaks to some of the questions that people have about who God is and what God is like. And last week, we had a little fun together with a great family movie, Toy Story 3, and uh, we learned how a mechanical monkey with symbols, what that monkey can teach us about facing sin and temptation. And we're going to continue that series today with another movie that you'll hear about in just a little bit. But let me just remind you of some of my hopes for this series. Part of my hope for this series is that we, as, as Christ followers, would learn to pay more attention to the world in which we live. Pay more attention to the culture around us. Sometimes I think we tend to do this. We, we get in that old mindset of we're, we're, we... We're going to be in the world, but we're not going to be of it. And so that being not of the world means that we're not going to pay any attention at all to what's around us. We're going to be that, I'm not listening, I'm not listening. We don't want to know what's going on. When God has called us as Christ followers, as ambassadors for the gospel, to engage our culture. And we can't engage our culture effectively unless we can understand it better. And so part of my hope is that through what we've shared over these last three weeks and what we'll share one more time next Sunday, is that you'll find some tools that you can speak into the culture around you. I also hope that these sermons will give you an opportunity, perhaps as parents, as a family, to look around and discover ways that you can leverage the culture around you to teach things of faith. We're called to not be conformed by the world, but be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. But we can also, by the power of the Spirit, take what is culture around us and transform it into teaching opportunities to share the things of God's Word. Well, someone a long time ago said that a picture is worth a thousand words. And that is incredibly true. A single picture can tell a very powerful story. And we see that in today's culture in things like Snapchat and Twitter and Instagram, where single pictures are a part of the story of people's lives. But there are other pictures that tell powerful stories. There are some in this room that perhaps can remember back uh, many years ago when organizations like the Time Magazine photographers were posting pictures of various things. And here's a picture of a relatively new Time Magazine cover. If you can't read the small print, it's, of course, time up the top. It's a blue field. It's actually the flag of the European Union. And the bottom of that flag is very frayed, and there's strings hanging down. And the headline on the front of that magazine says, The Unraveling of Europe. And if you've paid any attention to what's been going on over the last couple of years with uh, Brexit and, and the disbanding of the European Union in some way, and there's been conversations about uh, the currency that they use there, and maybe they're going to go back to individual countries, and they used to have a unified approach to immigration, and now countries are saying, I'm not sure what we want to do about that, and it's unraveling. Well, a single picture, a metaphor, if you will, is telling a powerful story about what's going on in our world. Advertisers understand the power of a story. Here's a couple uh, logos of well-known countries or companies. FedEx, okay, we all recognize that. But how many have ever noticed what's in the letters E and X? Can you see the arrow? How many can see the arrow in the E and X of FedEx? That arrow is not there by accident. 
It is actually there by intent. What FedEx is trying to communicate to you is an arrow indicates speed because you generally don't bend back a bow and sh shoot an arrow and it kind of creeps along. It zips along. That arrow represents speed. And an arrow represents accuracy and intent. So what is communicating in a single picture is that their delivery system is fast and it's accurate. Amazon. Okay, we can perhaps look at that bottom swoop there and say, hey, that looks like a smile. And that's what Amazon wants to communicate. Because they want you to know that ordering from Amazon brings you great joy. It's easy. Makes you happy. But also look at where that points. That arrow goes from the A to the Z in Amazon. Anybody ever noticed that before? Again, there by intent because a picture tells a powerful story. What Amazon is communicating in a single picture is not only is ordering from them fun, enjoyable, but anything from A to Z that you need, you can find at Amazon. Picture tells a thousand words. One more. One of my favorites. Baskin Robbins. Okay, the pink in the B and the R, what does it look like? 31. How many flavors is Baskin Robbins known for? 31. It's there by intent. Pictures tell a thousand words. They are metaphors for things in our life. Motion pictures, movies, motion pictures. If a single picture can tell a powerful story, moving pictures have an infinite amount of power to them. I mentioned to you last week that movie, movie, media, they are windows into worldviews. They are mirrors that reflect the heart of their creators and the heart of the culture around us. They are metaphors that represent things. I shared with you last week a quote from Robert Johnson where he says this, All movies, good or bad, they are educational. And Hollywood is the foremost educational institution on earth. Hollywood understands the power of image. And we need to pay attention to the stories that are being told. So what story will we tell today? Well, the movie is The Incredibles 2. How many folks have seen The Incredibles 2 movie? It's another animated movie. So if you don't have kids or grandkids, you may not have seen this movie. It is an animated superhero movie. Anybody in the room ever want to admit to uh, wanting to be a superhero and what your superpower might be? Or what your cool costume might be? Well, this is a movie about a family of superheroes and some additional superheroes as well. In the clip that we're going to watch, you're going to see the following characters. The villain of the story is a character called the Underminer. He's kind of a mole-looking kind of character, and he drives a vehicle that burrows beneath the earth, and he's burrowing under the city and specifically underneath a bank so that he can rob a bank. That's the underminer. The Incredibles, it's a family. There's Dad, and Dad has super strength. Mom is called Elastigirl. She is super elastic. She can stretch all over the, all over the place. They have a teenage daughter. She has the power of invisibility and can create force fields. A younger son who is super fast, uh, fast, appropriately named Dash. And they have a baby whose name is Jack. And Jack has the ability to shoot lasers out of his eyes and he can kind of jump dimensions. There's also another superhero that you're going to see in this clip, an African-American gentleman. His name is Frozone. And Frozone has the power to create ice with a single wave of his hand. Now a little bit of backstory before we show the clip. It is against the law in Incredibles 2 to be a superhero. The world around has decided that superheroes cause too much trouble, make too much messes when they're trying to fight crime and save things, so they've made it illegal to be a superhero. There is also ongoing tension in the family of the Incredibles, which actually is a carryover from the first movie, and there is a family tension at, in, in who is to be in charge, whose superpower matters the most, should their children be allowed to exercise their powers? There are roles that are in question. It's a part of the backstory. So as I've been saying all along before we watch this clip, don't just watch for entertainment. Watch for education. Watch for understanding and application. Last week I told you that you needed to listen to the dialogue. Today I actually want you to pay attention to what you see. 
So would you just watch this clip for a moment, please? So here is my question for you. What do you see? If we're to take a closer look at a film clip, what do we see? There are some things that might be obvious to you. Things like there's a family and there's boys and girls. They have different personalities. They have different abilities. They have different appearances. There's even people of different races. They have a task that they're called to, a mission, a rescue. And in this little clip, it took a combined effort to stop the enemy, the underminer. It took a combined effort to accomplish the task to rescue a city. But each brought a unique contribution to this task. And not every role was equal in its impact or its ability. Now, if we will think for a moment, if we will allow ourselves to think this way. This is an earthly story that can point us to a heavenly and biblical truth. In a way, this can be like a parable. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, in many ways, this clip provides for us, if we will open our hearts and our minds to it, this provides for us a picture of what God's design for the church can be. So listen carefully about what that picture is. What do I mean by God's picture? Take your Bibles, turn with me to Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. And let's journey together in God's Word and make some application today. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 1. I will refer to places in the entirety of chapter 12, though I will not read it in its entirety today. Paul begins this chapter by telling the church, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware. He wants his readers to understand the things of how God has gifted the church. Now pick it up in verse 4. There are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. There are a variety of ministries and the same Lord. There are a variety of effects, but the same God who works all things and all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the effecting of miracles, to another the prophecy, to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But the one and the same Spirit works all things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. You see, God has gifted his church. God's picture of life together for his followers is one where we recognize that he has gifted people individually. Yes, this is very much a secular film, if you want to use that word. I am not trying to pretend today that this movie was intended to have a spiritual meaning behind it, that the, the writers and the filmographers were thinking this is a church film. But let's take the picture that exists. Here is a family that all has different gifts. They all have different abilities. There are other superheroes in the story who have different gifts and abilities. But what did they do? They use those gifts and abilities together for a common purpose. God's picture in the church is that each one of us, if we name the name of Jesus Christ, have been gifted by the Spirit individually. Even if I have perhaps the same gifts as God has given to Randy, the fact that Randy has a different personality, she has a different experience, she has a different circle of influence, that means that Randy still uses her gift as God has gifted her individually. And the same is true for each one of us in this room today. God has gifted us individually. We could take this film and say, well, gee, there's the dad and he's got super strength. That's the most important. Or we can isolate people out and we could even do that in the church. 
But the common picture in the New Testament, what God has given us, not only throughout the New Testament, but in this passage of Scripture, is the metaphor of community. Here are the common pictures of the faith in the church. It's not one of individual. It is not individual as an individual person, but it is the body that is the metaphor for the church. It is the family of God. It is the building or the household of God. God's picture for how he gifts and how he desires for those gifts to be used is not in isolation, but it's in community so that we use those gifts together for a common purpose. In fact, that is exactly what the scriptures says. Verse number seven, but to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common purpose good. The gifts that you have, the gifts that I have are not mine or yours to keep and work in isolation. God has given us this picture of the body of Christ just like the movie or in a similar way, because I don't want to say just like, in a similar way to the movie where the family and other superheroes came together for the common good. God calls us from his word to come together with the gifts, the abilities that he has given to us for a common purpose. That body includes people of every race, every gender, every social strata. It does not matter. We are all drawn together into one. Look at verse 12 with me in in Corinthians chapter 12. For even as the body is one and has many members, all are members of the body. Though they are many, they are one body. So also is Christ, for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of the one spirit. God's picture for the body is not one of isolation by race or creed or nationality or color of skin or gender or social status or whatever that you want to say. God's body is not even separated out by levels of ability. God's body is one that is joined together, all working together, all a part of one body. That is God's picture for us. It is also a part of how God's mission is accomplished. In verses 4 and 6, we are called to use those gifts for a common good. We do not have the option as Christ followers whether we use our gifts or not. If we choose to neglect the gifts that God has given to us, if we do not choose to engage our giftedness for the purpose of the kingdom, then we are out living outside of not only God's will for us as individuals, but we are not a healthy part of the body of Christ because that is God's call for us. Each has a gift. Each gift is to be used. Each gift is needed, and it is needed for the common good. So that's God's picture. Let me share with you a flawed picture. And sadly, this happens far too often in the church. This flawed picture, pick it up with me again in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 14. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body. It's not for this reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desires. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now where are many me- now there are many members, but one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it's much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor, and our less presentable members become much more presentable. Whereas more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to the member which lacked, so that there may be no division in the body but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, the members rejoice with it. 
we many times in the church have a flawed view of what giftedness and what life in the body is. And here's one of the places where we have a flawed view. We have a flawed view of others. Paul is telling the Corinthian church that the hand can't say to the foot or the eye can't say to the ear, I don't need you. And we cannot do that in the church either. We can't look at one another and say, I don't need what you bring to the table. If we take an animated children's family movie like The Incredibles and the father tried to thwart the enemy all by himself, it would have been an impossible task. He can't look to the other superheroes, whether it's his family or the other superheroes in the movie, say, no, nah, no, nah, I got this, I don't need your skill. And we cannot do the same thing in the church. We can't look at each other and say, you know what, I don't want to be bothered with them. They're probably going to mess it up. They're going to cause trouble. We don't have time for that. I'll just do it myself. We can't look at others in the church and say, you know what, they're too young to be used. They're too young to acknowledge any value that they have. We can't do it on the flip side and look at people and say, you know what, they're too old. They're washed up. They're has-beens, whatever labels you want to put like society does and say there's no room for them. We need each other. We have a flawed view of others if that's how we look at each other. Society devalues all the time. It does not take much for us to look at, at, at our society, whether it's in the media or other things in culture, and know that people are devalued in all kinds of ways. We devalue human life, and so we have this whole conversation about abortion. We devalue people who are older in life, and so we have conversations about assisted suicide so that we can get rid of the people that are old and don't have value for us. We've devalued people with mental illness and we've not poured time and energy in addressing a, a very real problem in our country. We devalue the homeless. We don't make much effort. And I'm talking about society in general. Our society devalues people all the time. The church has never been called to be a place where people are devalued. God has called us. God has given us a picture of valuing every part of the body of Christ. But we also have a flawed understanding of gifting. We have preconceived ideas about what those gifts should be and what those gifts should do or even who gets those gifts. We have a flawed view of gifting. We can look down on others rather than affirming their unique gifts. We'll raise up gifts like preaching and teaching and say, man, those are the really powerful gifts and we're going to give them all kinds of honor. But the person who has the gift of encouragement... No, we don't even pay attention to that. We have a flawed view and a flawed understanding of gifting. We think that gifting is only for the special or the privileged. Oh, no, I don't, I, I don't have any gifts. God's given gifts like pastor and teacher, and so I don't have anything to bring to the table. No, 1 Corinthians 12 tells us that every believer in the body of Christ has a gift. So we must come to understand that gift and see that it is used together for the kingdom. But we can also have a flawed attitude when it comes to God's picture and gifting. We can take our gift and we can turn that gift strictly inward. We can say, well, if I leverage my gift in the kingdom, what's in it for me? I can take that gift and turn it inward. This is a quote from Tim Keller. I love his words. Tim Keller says this, You and I, we were made for mutual self-giving, for other-directed love. Self-centeredness destroys the fabric of what God has made. If you have a flawed attitude or a motive about gifting in the church and your gifting specifically, you will mar what God has made. God has called us to have a proper view of it. So we're not called to covet or to envy someone else's gift. We are not called to be prideful of our own gift. We are not called to show lack of gratitude for the gifting of others. We are called, as Corinthians 12 tells us, to show honor, to care about the entire body of Christ. We have a flawed picture Sometimes our flawed picture is that we just fear opposition. 
There always seems to be somebody saying to us, we can't do that, or you shouldn't do that, or you're too young, or you don't know enough, or whatever it is. And that impacts our attitude or our motive about using our gift. It's a flawed picture. So what are we called to do? Well, we are called, as I've said over the last three weeks, we are called to live a better story. We are called to show a better picture, not only inside these walls, but you and I are called to show a better picture to the world. It's a part of the mission that God has called us to. Yes, in The Incredibles, they had a mission to thwart the underminer. But you and I, as a part of the body of Christ, have a much bigger and far more important mission to be a part of, and it calls for all of us to live a better story. How many know what this next picture is? <clears throat> Anybody know what that is? It's the bat phone. How many remember the bat phone? Okay. For Batman, that bat phone rang when there was an emergency, and then bat, Batman ran to answer that emergency. My dad was a doctor. He was the chief of staff at the little hospital there in Millersburg, and he was also county coroner for over 30 years. There was a period of time in my growing up in my household that we had a bat phone on the wall. It was red. The only people that had that number was the hospital and then law enforcement, fire, and rescue. And when that phone rang, Dad knew that on the other end was somebody that had a specific need for that moment. For you and I, we don't have to wait around for a phone to ring. God doesn't have here and there perhaps a mission for us. God has an ongoing mission in this world, and we are called to live each and every day, moment by moment, a better story and communicate a more powerful picture than what the world sees. So what do we do to communicate that better story? Two things. This is what I call you to as I come near to the end of my message today. We are called today to renew our commitment to the body of Christ. Once again, I'm going to invite you to go back to Corinthians chapter 12. Verses 25 and 26, Paul says to the church that there is not to be division in the body. There's not supposed to be division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all members suffer with it. If one member is honored, the members rejoice with it. We are called today, and I'm calling us today, to a fresh commitment to the body of Christ. The body of Christ that calls this place their home church, but to the body of Christ universal. We need each other. One is not enough. We cannot leave the work of the kingdom just to a select few. We need each other. In fact, you can turn, you know, if you want to say it, you can, but just look at the people next to you. The truth is, you and I need the people that are sitting next to you in the pew because that is how God has designed the church to work. The family needed to work together in this movie and in the first Incredibles movie. They discovered that trying to work by themselves was not enough. They discovered that they had to work together as a family. We as the family of God must work together and so today I want to call us to a renewed commitment to the body of Christ and a part of that call is that if you don't know your giftedness from the Holy Spirit, then I want to help you find that. And I believe that there are others in this body who would want to help you discover your gifts. And not only do I want you to know what your giftedness is from the Spirit, I want to help you find ways that you can leverage that gift in the kingdom for the common good, for the building of the body. I want us to renew our commitment to the body of Christ today by making a commitment to one another to practice love, to practice grace, to practice patience, to offer words of encouragement to one another. Why? Because the truth is this. Sometimes living out of our giftedness is messy. Sometimes it's just plain and simple messy. 
you and I don't always get it right. Sometimes when we step into our giftedness, we'll try something and we'll stumble and we'll fall. Are we going to be a place, are we going to be a body of Christ that will extend mercy and grace to one another, that will encourage one another? Our, our, our young fellow lighting the candles today. I don't know whether that bothered him or not, that his wick went out or not. But will the church come alongside him and say, you know, it's okay. It's not a problem. Let me relight that for you. And, and Jeff did. I'm so grateful that he was there. Relit it for him. Helped him out. That is the call of the church. Renew our commitment to the body. And sometimes that commitment impacts how we talk to one another or how we talk about one another. Will we make today a fresh commitment by the power of the Spirit to walk in love and in grace and encouragement and say to one another, I need you and you need me, and let's, by God's grace, figure out how we can make this journey together for the cause of Christ. Secondly, I think we need to renew our commitment to God's mission. God's call to faith and mission is a communal one. He doesn't call us just as individuals. He calls us as the body of Christ. Though each gift is unique, it is also how God's grace is revealed. And so we need to follow God's gifting and engage those gifts because God says that when we do, when we all do, that is how the grace of God in its various forms is revealed to the world. It's revealed to us inside the body of Christ. I need to see your gifts in operation because that's how I experience a deeper measure of God's grace. And the world needs to see us using our gifts as the body of Christ because that's the only way that they are going to see and experience God's grace. And as I mentioned to you before, there is a crisis that is far greater than an animated family movie. There is a crisis far greater than the underminer, and we have a purpose that is far greater than his. We have a purpose that has eternal implications. Eternal implications. Think about that for just a moment. You using your gifts has eternal implications. If we do not use our gifts individually and collectively, God's eternal mission of seeing people saved and redeemed and brought into the body of Christ will fall short in some way. Now, know this. God can accomplish his mission without any of us. He can do it very well without any of us. But God in his wisdom, God in his grace has chosen this thing called the church to be the arm that he accomplishes his mission. We need to engage that mission. Our enemy is not bent on robbing a bank in an animated movie. The enemy of our soul is bent on the destruction of souls. And there should be an urgency among us, church, because Christ's return is soon. He is returning soon. And the thought of people entering into eternity lost and apart from Jesus Christ ought to burden our souls heavily. And there should be an urgency for us as a church to commit in a fresh new way to God's mission in the world. We have a community around us that is lost and dying. We have a community around us that is in the throes of addiction to narcotics and all kinds of things, alcoholism. We have a community in a region that is caught in the trap of human trafficking. There is an urgency to God's mission. Today, church, would you stand with me and make a fresh commitment to God's mission? We need each other, and God needs all of us as a part of the one body of Christ to stand together and serve together for the kingdom. So in just a moment, I'm going to have Mandy come and lead us in the song that we sang a few moments ago. But I ask you, what story are you living? Are you living God's better story or are you living out a flawed story? More concerned about your own things than about God's purpose and plan and his mission. Search your heart today and ask whether God uh, or whether um, you have had attitudes towards people that says that you don't really value their gifts. 
Maybe you have a hard time saying to somebody else, I need you. I'm glad that you're here. Ask God to search your heart. So would you bow your heads with me this morning? Father, thank you for today. Lord, maybe today for some in this room, it's, it's a little bit challenging to watch a, a video clip and see how it can teach us something. But God, today I pray that by the power of your Spirit that you'll help us make some visual connections to this picture of the body of Christ that shows people of every gender and, and race, every level of ability, every age, working together for a common cause. Because that is the picture of the church that your word gives to us. Lord, you have called us to this place on purpose. Your word says that you place people in the body as you see fit. So every person that's in this room is here by your design. And you have gifted people uniquely by your wisdom and purpose and plan so that we might together as the one body of Christ serve the mission of your redemptive, restorative work in the world in which we lived. So God, today, would you call us to a fresh commitment to the body of Christ? Would you call us today to a fresh commitment to your mission in this world so that we might live out a far better story than any movie could paint for us? But it's the story that you've called us to. So, Father, thank you for who you are. I thank you for your grace to me and to every person in this room. Because, Lord, the truth is we never get it always right. But you are loving and you are gracious and you are ever and always call us onward and upward to Christ-likeness. So, Father, work in us today, I pray. And I ask these things in your name. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning?